All right, welcome back everybody. Let's talk about conformity. Conformity is all about social influence. So we'll begin with just a basic introduction about what social influence is all about. And then we'll start talking a little bit about how sometimes we can have an automatic reaction to social influence. Even more so than other chapters, this chapter on conformity really focuses on the powerful effects of social influence, which in general we can define as a study of how people are affected by the real and even the imagined pressure of others. As we delve into this chapter, we're going to talk about three key topics, conformity, compliance, and obedience. Each one of these concepts is related, but they're distinguished from each other by the amount of pressure that would be exerted on us in each situation. We'll talk about each one of these concepts in detail throughout the chapter, but for now, keep in mind that this chapter will examine several factors that lead us to either resist social influence or to submit to social influence. And keep this in mind too, not all social pressure is exerted equally. In fact, it might be helpful to view this chapter through what we call a continuum of social influence. You'll see what I mean on the next slide. You'll see that the key concepts I mentioned before, conformity, compliance, and obedience, form a range of social influence that spans from relatively light social influence to pretty darn heavy social pressure. All right, let me show you what I mean by the continuum of social influence. The bottom line is that in any social situation, the pressure that is exerted on us can vary. And of course, sometimes we might resist that influence and sometimes we might yield to that influence. Some of you might not be familiar with the term yielding in this sense. It just simply means submitting to that influence or giving in to that social influence. This is where you'll see those three key terms coming into play. So for example, we can conform to group norms or we can be independent. We can comply with specific requests or we can be assertive. We can obey the commands of an authority figure, or we can defy that authority figure. So you're probably starting to get a sense, just based on the terms that I'm using, conform to group norms, comply with requests, or obey commands, that social pressure is sometimes relatively light and sometimes relatively heavy. So when we're looking at the continuum, over here we're talking about relatively light social pressure, and over here at the ends we're talking about relatively heavy social pressure. Now, throughout the chapter, we're going to make this all really clear. I'm just introducing some of these points right now, some of these concepts, really just some of the terms. But there will be many examples to follow throughout the chapter, so just hang tight. Well, speaking of distinctions between light and heavy social pressure, our responses to social pressure are sometimes really well thought out or even strategized, but sometimes our responses to social pressure are virtually automatic. Let's discuss those situations next. It's pretty neat when you start to see that we respond almost reflexively to many subtle social influences. So for example, if you see somebody yawning, that relatively subtle social pressure can influence you to start yawning. In fact, this particular effect with yawning is so robust that you might start yawning just when you see a cartoon yawning. I mean, you might even start yawning when you see a monkey yawning. In fact, we often mimic each other unwittingly, without even really knowing it. This is often referred to as the chameleon effect. We'll talk about why that happens in a second. First, let me just walk you through the results of a research study that demonstrates this. Imagine a situation where people were randomly assigned to one of two situations. In one situation, they were put in the same space in the same room with a confederate who started rubbing their face a lot. It wasn't something very obvious that they were doing, but they were touching and kind of rubbing their face. In another condition, the people were assigned to be in a room in a space with a confederate who was shaking his foot a lot. Now, the interesting thing was we wanted to see how often would the participant start rubbing their face, touching their face, or shaking their own foot. When the people were put in a situation where the confederate was rubbing their face a lot, they tended to rub their face more than they shook their foot. But when the people were put in a situation where the confederate was shaking their foot a lot, they tended to shake their foot a lot more than they rubbed their own face. That's a classic example of the chameleon effect. Well, let's now focus on why. Why might that happen? One theory is that that type of mimicry puts us in sync with each other. 
And when we're in sync with each other, it allows us to interact with each other a little bit more easily. So as a communicator, if you're mimicking what I'm doing, you know, you're not making it really obvious. You're not even really aware of it. But if you're mimicking what I'm doing, I'm feeling more like you get me, like you understand what I'm thinking, like you're understanding what I'm feeling, you're understanding what I'm saying. And furthermore, we tend to like people more when they're similar to us, including when they act similarly to us. So in this sense, an automatic reaction that includes mimicking what the other person is doing helps grease the social wheels of society. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.